but it does seem to me personally that a ceasefire has to be the first step. That is something that people have been calling for all over the world, but it's something that world leaders have been reluctant to say. Just watch Justin for Trudeau, Trudeau. <laughs> almost say it, of and then correct him. Stop being embarrassing for two minutes challenge impossible Canada over and over and over. Oh my God. Before we begin, I just want to say one quick thing. Um, I know a lot of people when it comes to late night TV shows, they talk of them as uh, if they were just liberal filth, you know, trash of the highest order, spewing bile from liberal mouths and promoting neoliberal capitalism every single time they speak. I hate all these late night talk shows. And I agree with you in most cases, in most cases, you know, if you want to make fun of Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, oh, just the shittiest Jimmy's there is, right? Um, that's, that's totally uh, fair and valid. Uh, I have a couple exceptions. One, Conan makes me laugh, so I don't care if he's apolitical. He, he, I think he's funny, and I think he does the funny thing. I don't watch late night TV, but when I see a Conan clip, I'm usually like, Conan was that, that was that was pretty funny. So you, you, you that was funny. He's, he's a funny, funny man. He does the funny things. It makes me laugh. So I like that. Uh, but in terms of politics, Hassan Minhaj. Uh, and uh, the Patriot Act was one of the better ones, and, and it was really sad. It finally got uh, you know taken down. Um, but in terms of domestic issues, especially, he was really really good at covering that. He was also really really good at covering uh, a lot of international issues surrounding Saudi Arabia, for example, and why is the United States always so deeply tied with Saudi Arabia? Stuff like that. It was a good show, and I think sometimes the left has to remember that not everyone is as well informed as you are on a topic. And that's important because you might be discussing things with your family sometimes and get really taken aback if they say something because it's almost insulting and it's not coming always from a place of hatred or bigotry. It could be coming sometimes from a place of ignorance where someone on the other end is suddenly like, ah, I, I, I don't uh, I don't agree with you because I think this is harming children and it's child abuse. And uh, honestly, they're trying to turn the kids gay. And, and it's like. Oh, that's not it at all. So gay kids exist and they go to school like everyone else and it's totally fine for them to feel as safe as every other kid. Do you, do you think if a kid is born gay that he should feel like danger or, or have some kind of danger? I guess not, but like, I, I, are they born gay or do they become gay because they're like taught gay stuff in, in the woke media by Disney and stuff like that? It's like, so you know uh, the statistics with gay kids, right? Like, you know how hard their lives can be, right? Like, they can get kicked out of their family, they have higher rates of depression, anxiety, uh, you know, uh, suicidal ideation, stuff like that. Do you think people are willingly choosing that harder life by choice every single time? Does, does that logic compute with you? Or what about the fact that, like, nearly half of all homeless children happen to be LGBTQ+. Like, that that sounds pretty sad and bad, right? Do, do you think that's part of it? I guess you're right. That doesn't really make sense. So... Oh, so it's not so it's not about turning the kids gay. No, not at all. Has not you can't do that. There's not like a magic spell you can do. We, we haven't you know learned the the gay conjuring spell yet. I mean, we're working on it real hard. We we want to basically uh, pansexify everybody. We're we're going to be hitting the pure homosexuals as well. The pure homosexuals will become a little bit more heterosexual, and the pure heterosexuals become a little more homosexual, just so everyone can enjoy the the rich tapestries of life. But until that time, and and you know the release is is coming. Um, yeah, that's that's just the reality of the world we live in. So the reason I'm rambling right now is because John Oliver, in some ways, he can fuck up and he can certainly say things where you're just like, oh, God damn it, you're not meeting the moment. But there's other times when it's very, very useful and has a lot of utility for him to suddenly have a very mainstream, massive audience of people on HBO, a lot of them liberals. A lot of them well-to-do libs. A lot of them can suddenly learn about a topic and suddenly be like, oh shit. Because what's more important is having more and more people want to cease fire now and demand a cease fire now from our politicians. And that's just the start, by the way. A ceasefire is just the start. There's a lot of work to do. There's there's ending all military and arms sales to Israel. But that's something that needs to be fought for and won and done. There's a returning of Palestinians their land and, and rebuilding, by the way. You know, this is this is something that's gonna be happening to be fought for. I'm sorry. Like the the marches shouldn't stop once a ceasefire is called. It's a ceasefire called where forty two percent of all homes are damaged or destroyed. Yeah. There, there's a lot of work to do there. Uh, like every single facet of their lives being dominated and controlled by the IDF and the Israeli government, that has to stop. That has to stop just as urgently. Because yeah, the flow of water, electricity, food, fuel, medical resources, we now know how it's completely, like the rest of the world does, they now know it's completely dependent on Israel. So I haven't actually seen this. I don't know what direction it's going to go in. I'm going to assume, like most things, John Oliver is going to start with a little bit of 
sugar or medicine or whatever. Yeah, a little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. Sorry, he's British. I'm trying to remember my Mary Poffins uh, references. But yeah, that's that's what I'm assuming. So it's going to be able to uh, allow for people, you know, condemn Hamas, explain how bad the attack was on October 7th, which should be uncontroversial. You know, the targeting of civilians and the, ki the killing of civilians is bad. Things like that uh, to be able to get people on board. But we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so much for joining us. It has been a busy week. Elections on Tuesday saw big wins for Democrats. Ohio voted to enshrine abortion rights in its state constitution. And the SAG strike finally ended, meaning that movies will be back in production. Although, to be honest, I'm not even sure that I need movies anymore since this 17-minute video was released of what I can only describe as a hamster Gatsby living its best life. <laughs> This show also loves its animals. Like it's it's easily like fifty percent of all the jokes are animal based. You know, <laughs> like that's a delicious looking giraffe, like an animal cracker. And then I'm, oh my god, you mentioned animals. <laughs> this is pretty amazing. Seventeen minutes. Damn, son. I could watch this for seventeen minutes. Oh hell it's yeah. A to their board of governors. The people in Gaza elected Hamas. It's a terrorist organization. That is their government. How do you say Hamas doesn't represent the Palestinian people when they voted Hamas in to represent them? OK, so very quickly, that is Tucker Carlson's replacement at Fox, Jesse Waters. He's a lot like Tucker, except less charismatic, way dumber, and with somehow even more of an I've killed someone during a fraternity hazing accident vibe, which is really saying something. Because, look, it is true that Gazans did, at one point, elect Hamas. But if you think that makes them all complicit in war crimes their government commits, then, boy, do I have bad news for you about decades of US foreign policy. <laughs> and also... There are That's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, I'm also going to say, but I'm going to assume, hopefully he's going to talk about this, how half the population wasn't even old enough to vote for Hamas. Um, I am curious if he's going to start talking about, uh, you know, all, all the information we have now, statements by, you know, Yasser Arafat, for example, about uh, Israel and uh, the promotion of, of uh, Hamas uh, as they were coming to power. Some huge asterisks on Gazans electing Hamas. First, that election happened in 2006. And there hasn't been one since. And given that children make up roughly half of Gaza's population, that means most Gazans weren't even born when the last election took place. What's more, Hamas didn't win a majority. It only won with a bare plurality of the votes. And it did so by running against Fatah, which was widely reviled for incompetence and corruption at the time. Those were the key issues in that election. Also, Hamas went out of its way to present itself as more moderate back then. In fact, here is that same Hamas official who recently justified the October 7th attacks shortly before that 2006 election. We are a moderate organization. Really, we are not radical organization and we are not extremist or fundamentalist. No, we are an open-minded organization sticking, believe in democracy and the freedom and political pluralization. Yeah, Hamas really tried to rebrand itself, kind of like Domino's did when they ran ads admitting that the sauce tastes like ketchup, the crust tastes like cardboard, and they <laughs> promised to work days, nights and weekends to get better. <laughs> but unfortunately, like Domino's, Hamas is a terrible organisation that in no way kept its promises. <laughs> because in the years following, that tone of open-minded freedom clearly fell away. Not only has there not been another election, most people in Gaza don't believe they have the freedom to speak openly. One poll found that under Hamas rule, 68% believe that the right to participate in a peaceful protest was not protected or was protected only to a limited extent. And human rights groups have said that Hamas forces have carried out a brutal campaign of abductions, torture and unlawful killings against Palestinians accused of collaborating with Israel and have attacked members and supporters of Fatah, their main political rival. And the truth is, Many Gazans will say that they don't want Hamas in charge. Polls show if true peace were available, many Palestinians would embrace it. In fact, one conducted right before October 7 found 73% oh. favouring a peaceful settlement to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it's notable that in July, despite all the restrictions on dissent in Gaza, there were actually people on the streets chanting slogans including, Fuck off Hamas! And We Want to Live! 
And look, even if all Palestinians in Gaza did support Hamas, which they do not, the relentless bombings of civilians there would still be abhorrent. Collective punishment war is a war crime. But the fact is there is much more criticism of Hamas in Gaza that Americans in general, and these dipshits in particular, are willing to admit. And that's also one of the fucked up things is that it's just shut down conversation or even talking about it. You bring up anything. It's like, well, wait, hold on. Are you saying it was a good thing what Hamas did? It's like, no, I'm not saying that. And it's like, oh, so you're for Hamas bombing children? Is that what you're saying? No, we're not talking about that. I'm trying to say that right now this conflict is being sold as a war. It's not a war. Again, this is an occupation and this is an occupational force that is now bombing a largely civilian population, half of whom are children, and killing a fuck ton of them. That's what's happening. This, this is a slaughter. These are war crimes after war crimes happening every fucking single day. That's what's really happening. Palestinians these are bus bombings by Hamas in Israel as part of their own efforts to derail the peace accords that Netanyahu was first elected prime minister. And his message of, I am the only one who can keep you safe, has been consistent ever since. Here he is in the run-up to Israel's 2014 election, making that point again. I feel the Jewish nation is under threat and I'm prepared to mitigate that danger. It's what the state of Israel expects from me, and it's what I'll do. Well, that is a big claim that just hasn't dated very well. Honestly, I haven't seen a politician's words age so poorly since Hillary Clinton tweeted, happy birthday to this future president. <laughs> so he has always been hard right, but it's worth taking a wah, minute wah. to underscore just how extreme his current government is. Because the truth is, Netanyahu has been struggling to hold office in the last half a decade. Voters there actually endured five elections in just four years because neither Netanyahu nor anyone else could form a stable majority. He only made it back into power last year by forming a coalition with those on the furthest right wing of Israeli politics, leading to the most right wing government in the country's history. And by the way, that's like something really important to remember when you see politicians like Joe Biden, like actually just constantly treating him as if he's a friend, as if like, you know, we're, we're, we're strong allies and all that kind of stuff. That again, it's a far right government. And, and people for the longest time were just, it was like taboo for you to ever uh, like, you know, criticize it because at the same time they try to associate crit criticism of Israel with, uh, you know, anti-Semitism. Uh, whereas like you should criticize it in the same way you would criticize any other sovereign nation. In, in that, yes, this is a far-right administration. Absolutely it is. Just watch this woman who works with Doctors Without Borders. It is the, the worst oh, humanitarian so catastrophe I've experienced in my lifetime. You know, there's an acronym in the, in the Gaza Strip right now. You know, I, I'm a pediatric intensive care doctor. I see a lot of suffering in my career. There's an acronym that is unique to the Gaza Strip, and it's called it's WCNSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. Children, and it is used not infrequently in the last three weeks. Wounded child, no surviving family should not exist as an acronym. She's right. And personally, I'm going to take my cues about what constitutes a humanitarian crisis from the humanitarians here. I really don't have it in me to show you footage of people in agony tonight, but I do want you to see some kids in Gaza who've been displaced speak about what they've been going through. <laughs> So if you didn't know, I'm working on uh, a video, I'm probably going to be releasing it this week, uh, on everything of the past month, like all, I'll take, I've taken all of the clips, all the footage, editing it down into kind of like a manufacturing consent style, like documentary, um, and it's almost finished, and obviously it like, it just eats your soul to, to not only watch this stuff, but edit it. Uh, for hours and hours and hours where you're just like you're constantly having to step away from the computer because you can't stop breaking down. This series of interviews that, you're, that he's showing you on screen right now was one of the only like happy video footage slash obviously incredibly depressing because it goes back and forth. But some of the kids that they interview, they're still so full of like hope and joy in the interviews themselves that this was like one of the only clips that was like a positive one that wasn't showing, you know, dead babies and war footage and stuff like that, that like also broke me. Cause like when you, when you just, when you see like the whole process for so long has been about dehumanization 
And that's that's really what has programmed people to be able to say sentences like, uh, well, Israel is right to defend itself. Uh, what they're doing is a strategic military operation or going as far as being like, uh, we have to destroy Hamas. And yes, that means, I'm sorry, getting rid of all of the uh, Palestinians or we have to accept just like, you know, all, all these Palestinians being killed because at the end of the day, I mean, they all want to kill all Jewish people. So it's the only thing we do like to get to those points of complete dehumanization. That's years of absorbing mainstream media message that echoes a lot of those sentiments. They might not be as extreme at any given time, but for the most part, they never tell you the true story and they never let you see that. And I, I'd say this last month is probably the biggest and largest uh, like global fucking shattering of that myth where, where all of a sudden what, what few people still had ideas like that in their heads, all of a sudden it's like, holy fuck, this is what's happening. Like you, you even see it in the eyes of fucking Wolf Blitzer of all people, right? Like shit like that. Um, and, and now people are finally allowed to speak about it and, and explain it. And, and once you do, and once you do learn the history, like I can't tell you how many incredible uh, TikTok videos I, I've gone through of Jewish people uh, who have firsthand experience either living in Israel or, uh, you know, being raised in a very orthodox family and stuff like that, talking about how they had been taught and raised one way. And now since they've become a little bit older, they've done all their own research and, and just they're, they're like, I, I had a completely different view of this entire thing. I didn't know the history. I didn't I didn't know what was actually taking place on the ground. I didn't know about just the utter control and oppression of Palestinians and just viewing them as subhuman and all that kind of stuff. And and like this is this is not what's taught to you. And and mainstream media does a really good job of reflecting that to all of us. Where we people just sit at home and you can have people who might not be monsters. You know, they might not be the actual monsters who are completely fine with the, like the mass slaughter of children, but in their own heads they're like well, yeah, but like terrorists, so, you know, the terrorists did terrorist shit and the terrorists got to go. So, I mean, anyway, you know, you got to you got to do what you got to do. War, it's ugly. It's ugly. But, you know, it's the terrorists. It's, it's their fault. They're using human shields. <laughs> This one kid in particular. عبيوتنا ونحرف النام ونكيف أنا هيك أنا هيك حابب Yeah, I'd really like them to be able to chill the fuck out too that message <laughs> but it does seem to me personally that a ceasefire has to be the first step that is something that people have been calling for all over the world but it's something that world leaders have been reluctant to say just watch Justin Trudeau, Trudeau almost say it course. and then correct himself. Fucking we stop being embarrassing for two minutes challenge impossible Canada over and over and over. Oh my God. It's like, yeah, so a month ago, you guys really embarrassed yourself. What? Oh, the, the whole like standing ovation for a Nazi, like actual Nazi. You guys gave him a standing ovation, made Zelensky look ridiculous. That was bad, right? Yeah, that was deeply embarrassing. Don't worry. Here comes Justin Trudeau, the progressive to meet the moment and understand that, yeah, thousands and thousands of kids getting crushed to death and starving and that's bad right he's gonna he's gonna do the right thing he'll he'll you know what there were times when canadian prime ministers defied the rules of america they didn't stand by like jean chrétien did not want to join in the second iraq war he was like no canada's not gonna do that have fun not joining the alliance i'm like you can't call us the axis of evil we're canada you need our water so yeah not gonna do that though not joining the second war in iraq but you know, we'll send you a whole bunch of canadians to go to afghanistan we'll we'll do that peacekeeping whatever you need but yeah they'll go fuck up some shit in afghanistan you know, but, but we're not doing Iraq. We're, we're skipping over that one, right? So I, I saw a headline the other day that said, uh, what was it? Insiders say that there isn't internal pressure from the United States to Justin Trudeau, like some people were assuming, to not call for a ceasefire. This is his own doing. 
Like, if you want to call him Genocide Justin, go right ahead, because his own alliances to say the state of Israel are doing uh, the work here. It's not like I have to do whatever Joe Biden says. At any, I, I got the call. I got the call. Joe Joe said no. Joe said no. No. He said we could use other terms, though. I got I got a fancy list here. Uh, humanitarian pause. And if someone says that's a really fucked up way to say you're just going to keep bombing kids as soon as like a couple of hours go by, just look them in the eye and say you're deeply concerned over and over. You know, we're deeply concerned for all Canadians. We need to see a cease. Uh, we need to see a, a humanitarian pause so we can flow. Uh, we need to see ceasing of, of, of the levels of violence that we're seeing. Wow. He stopped himself mid-word there. He cease. literally ordered a ceasefire on the word ceasefire. And you got outflanked by Macron. Macron. Are you fucking kidding me? The dude who just banned Palestinian flags at protests? That fucking dystopian place? Danger whenever it stops. So why not stop right now? Continuing down this path only creates more extremists, which is the last thing that anybody needs. And I don't want to say anything and potential global conflicts you don't want all the other countries which they are th openly threatening right now i should add by the way like you have a, a israeli officials who are who are making statements like what you should do if you happen to live in an arab country right now is to remain silent and, and to not take action while you witness what has happened like shit like that you're like wait what and then being like yes we're, we also have to take out hezbollah and lebanon so we're gonna have another th uh, theater of war there and then yes we're probably going to be uh, assisting the united states and what is going on in in syria like to stop expanding this Yemen has already uh, declared war on Israel. That's this is not good. You don't want more countries like yeah. Saudi Arabia is definitely not looking to rock the boat with the United States. Of course not. But at the same time, you keep committing atrocities and war crimes that the whole world is witnessing in real time in 4K all day, and it's making everyone both horrified, furious, mad, sad, all simultaneously, and taking them to extremes. Have you seen how many people's brains have broken online in the last little while where you're like what the fuck are you serious like sarah silverman you you are posting about like dehydrating children starving children why are you posting about that well i was i was just smoking that genocide endo know what i'm saying that's that's all it is you know just just a little bit of that fucking weed that makes you want to take water away from kids no some hostages families are also utterly furious at the military tactics that netanyahu's employing right now we have to engage in negotiations. We have to do it now. They say that the only solution is to destroy, to flatten Benjamin Netanyahu Gaza. has turned they down. They mentioned the hostages. Never. Hostage negotiations. Right, and you can see how infuriating that would be. And I know that for many Israelis, there is an understandable sense of fear and precarity right now amid the specter of Hamas attacks and rockets flying overhead. But it's worth also acknowledging the overwhelming sense of precarity among Palestinians living under a blockade and a barrage of Israeli rockets. And it has to be possible to feel the pain. Oh, not to mention, could you imagine? Being a Palestinian, living in the West Bank, and witnessing the mass slaughter of your families, your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, like everything just happening, you know, and, and having to see parts of it all the fucking time, all day. In, in one community without denying it in another. It has to be. That is perhaps the most necessary precondition for peace because real peace here will clearly be difficult. It, it's going to be struggled toward. As part of a yeah, while being killed themselves, justice, while children are being killed by the IDF, where Hamas has no with rule. all the decisions that brought us to this point. And I know that hope is scarce right now, but I did see something this week which gave me a seed of hope. It involved this Israeli man, Rami El Hanan, who lost his 14-year-old daughter to a Hamas suicide bombing 26 years ago. He actually co-directs a group called the Parent Circle with that Palestinian man that I showed you earlier where parents who've lost children to this conflict get together to work toward peace. El Hanan was asked if recent events had changed his worldview at all, and his response is worth listening to. You know, we are in a circle of uh, blood for, for the last uh, 75 years, and this is just another round. Uh, nobody expected the uh, viciousness and the cruelty of this round, but it was expected. You cannot put two million people in a box, close the cover, and... Uh, expect nothing will happen. It will not stop unless we talk. You cannot uh, annihil annihilate uh, Hamas. You cannot uh, uh, ignore six million people, Palestinians, living here in the uh, Holy Land. 
and you cannot expect them to go away. They will not go away. We will not go away. We are doomed to live here together and we have to choose whether to share this land or to share the graveyard under it. Exactly. And it is inspiring that despite what that man went through, he's still committed to achieving peace through talking. And it shows that any conversation around this has to begin with empathy or we're just fucked. And obviously, we don't know how all this ends, but there are a few things that we do know. We know that dehumanizing people leads to violence. We know that violence leads to even more brutality and destruction. And we know that, crucially, breaking that cycle is unfortunately going to require leadership significantly different than the ones currently in place. And now, this. Um, yeah, I thought that was excellent. I thought that was that was really, really good. I thought, um, and I, I'm going to play whatever comes next because I do want to see what it is. But like, I, I think so much of that and a lot of the, the parts that he's discussed, probably not well known amongst, again, liberal circles or mainstream media circles. So it's really, really good to see a lot of that. Uh, I don't think any mainstream media host is going to speak about the subject without uh, acknowledging, uh, you know, what occurred on October 7th and obviously condemning it. Um, and also, if you are doing the right job, trying to contextualize what is happening and and like you know before people start saying like well well yeah you want a ceasefire but a ceasefire was broken it's like yeah but by israel multiple times i mean if, if you want to call the terms and conditions of a ceasefire uh not being violated when you like illegally uh enter mosques when you gas them when you when you break into refugee camps uh when you shoot them when you when you uh you know indiscriminately kill civilians and sometimes you kill civilians in the west bank and sometimes you kill civilians in gaza but it is felt and hurt by the you know the hard of every single Palestinian, that kind of shit. Like, this, this the history didn't start on October 7th, and that doesn't change the fact that this is still an occupation. Again, in, in the Gaza Strip specifically, where they control the water, the food, the fuel, the electricity, and now the world is finally waking up to that because, you know, the the the, ta the taboo about speaking about this or even bringing up the fact that, like, you know, Embassy International had to watch themselves for years not calling this apartheid, and, 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 and so many organizations, like, if there's one country that's consistently, constantly committing war crimes openly uh, and, and with the full support of the United States while they're doing it, and then the full support of Canada and the full support of of Europe and the full support of so many uh, fucking Western nations over and over. So I thought, in that in that case, it's uh, it's really really good for them to bring uh, you know attention and, and knowledge to all of this. And now, do you enjoy the surfs but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs? Many are saying this. Well, we've got the solution for you. It's the Surf Times in podcast form, available on most major podcasting networks now. If you enjoy it, please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out, apparently, and it's free, just like the podcast. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. This show is produced by amazing people like you, and if you want to help us out, please consider donating over at patreon.com slash the surfs. The show is made possible thanks to Amazing Fletch, Anna Loves Riley, Ariane McCarthy, Cheryl Alvarez, Doug Cady, Everything Important, Hegbard Celine, La Media Panza, Matthew Scarborough, Multimondi, Omni, Peanut Butter Blondie, Political Papi, Quiet185, Rachel K, Riley and Anna, Roller Dragon, Ruby K, Sir Nickus, Spinach Monster, Stellar Vision, Sebastian Demo, Tech Tink, Trevbot EXE, Words Greenwood, and not to mention all of the amazing and fabulous people you now see before you.